Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 63. This session's focus is on the comparative religious subject of spiritual energy. In a kind of three-part series on alchemy, it seemed a natural transition to work itself back into a greater concept of energy, or how to make things achievable, how to actually work with things becoming. The root of the word energy is Greek as it moves into definitions of activity, action, operation, ergos, which means something that works. It works. Or related to the Proto-Indo-European root to do. And of course, Aristotle would liken this word to existence, reality, actuality, Something that makes things do things. It's not potential. It is the agent that makes things do. So to approach this subject, we're going to go across different traditions, some with more elaboration than others. But we start in the East with Qi. And this could be understood as electromagnetic energy vibrating at different frequencies. Of course, this concept is not wild by any means. Light is a vibration of energy. Color is a manner of a specific wavelength of energy. Sound, of which is the medium of this talk, is a vibration of energy. It's to say that all things are contingent on this energy, chi. Every object in the world having its own energy, or aura. And see, as soon as I introduce the word aura, then it's like, oh, are we slipping into the spiritual end of this, right? Chi, the vita, as it's known elsewhere, the vital force of which everything has, everything in the universe, especially every living thing. Chi, in the East, has been studied for over 10,000 years. It has its own concepts in Japan, in China, in India, of which we'll be talking about later, and also throughout Polynesia, of which we'll be talking about later. This concept goes across the world bearing different names and bearing different concepts. Bearing this name of Qi, then it is pertinent for us to mention yin and yang, male and female, undulations on the wavelength of energy which flows through all things. This hermetic truth as well, flux, flux. Everything has the masculine and the feminine in its archetype. The example used before in the course is that to eat food is a intaking. Yin. To speak out is an outward expression. Yang. These concepts of um, different functions of our bar body, the, the capillaries that open in your heart. Yin. The closing. Yang. Ki, or Reiki, is the Japanese twang to the Chinese qi. Rei qi, rei, corresponds to universal or magical. So the universal energy, rei qi, achieved through initiation and through practice, ex uh, not just experimentation, but, but um, familiarization. Self-cultivation of your own qi is qi lel or Lil, which is the use of your own chi upon yourself, or self-cultivation. In the previous um, talks on alchemy, it was discussed how eventually the Taoists in the East stopped practicing seeking the elixir of life, immortality, through external means 
eventually this turned into an internal trajectory to seek transmutation, transcendence through internal means instead of, say, drinking cocktails of mercury. And of course, Tai Chi isn't so far off to this, right? Again, working with this universal energy as it is in and outside of yourself. So, of course, this definition of Qi is quite flexible depending, of course, again, on its um, multiplicity of different states. We have what? Um, we have heat, right? That's thermal. We have electrical. Well, that's very, very popular nowadays. We have chemical, okay? Uh, particularly fitting for the alchemical talk, biological energy, right? Life energy, quantum, energy, raw, right? And all these different forms are all just different forms of it. Qi can also be thought of as consciousness, the specific energy of awareness. Now, this is what is pointed to when considering the observer effect, the observer effect in quantum physics. With the double split, why does it change? Because of observation. It changes because Qi, consciousness, is energy that is active in the world. Things come about because they are connected to this energy of consciousness. All is affected by it. There is also concepts for the pre-birth chi, or the chi that would create life, reproductive essence, jing chi. And there are exact sciences for how to understand the interplay of these kind of pre-birth energies that ultimately constitutes what becomes a human being, the sexual essence, or the, how it converts into spiritual essence, shen qi. And so you can see with this sophistication, with this um, articulation of this concept throughout the ages, we've become very advanced, you know, here in the East when it comes to how we can understand the subject and all of its nuance. The symbol for qi in Chinese, the Chinese symbol for it means no fire. When qi in the body is said to have been mastered, it means that it's uh, controlling its own yang uh, output, which is fire. It burns you up. Modern life necessitates so much yang energy, as has been previously discussed, that we tend to run towards inflammation, chronic inflammation, which is a, always a common denominator of our most systemic um, health issues. Our deterioration from literally burning up from the inside or aging, rapidly aging as a result of this, this yang energy. So ultimately, the seeking, as it would be put by the character or the symbol of qi, is to, uh, the mastery is to reduce the fire, no fire, which kind of puts an idealization onto the yang. But then again, as you would see like Bruce Lee, be like water, my friends, receptive as opposed to burning. Yeah? Burning is... A, a, a very active agent, right? Full of yang. Uh, destruction is yang. Destruction is what men have always done best. Physical destruction. Anyhow, there. this is a very soupy subject. So there's many different ways to take this. So it's not just the energy of itself. The energy is something that can be applied, right? Qi is something that's applied. So it takes this specific... Um, kind of confluence of intelligence or wisdom and the use of chi in order for it to be transmutation or used in higher frequencies or used to better means, right? So you can't hand something or anything dramatic power without it having the, the vessel to contain or the wisdom to properly utilize that power, which is a kind of trope that you'll see in, in shonen. <clears throat> so, with this same regard, in Taoism, 
the the ultimate goal is to allow this flowing of chi without resistance or judgment, as is the aforementioned, you know, yin predominance. The goal of energy is to bring it into a state of enlightenment. Now, that would be to say that you have um, heightened, ever heightened, ever transcended your vibration, which is a kind of, you know, what, a hippie trope or like a very fundamental... Um, kind of statement at the root of different religions, especially those that are higher, uh, more tied to mysticism. And, you know, transcendence as it goes along with uh, bouts of psilocybin and plant medicine, <clears throat> you know, there's often talk of how everything is vibrating, how everything is vibration. And so, yet again, it, it, it ties itself perfectly back into this subject of spiritual energy or just energy flat out or chi as we're discussing it here and so this this ultimate um process is happening on uh various levels right like as we mentioned chi is in many different forms so ultimately if one is seeking say self-consciousness, seeking um, moksha or seeking some form of enlightenment, then that would be to say that perhaps it's utilizing even the quantum level of the functions of vibration of energy into oneself. It's also to say that there are invisible processes and invisible um, facets to our beings that are not easily observable or have yet to be observable by scientific use and devices. So, you know, how, how far do we want this dissolve to go? Ultimately, to seek a state of emptiness is also something that can be procured through manipulation, through acupuncture. And, of course, what does acupuncture work with? Well, it's working with the chi. So the conscious circulation of chi, not just potentially from within the body, but also the conscious circulation of how you send it or work it outside of your body. And to work it, right, is, is another thing, because there's the seeking of manipulation towards ill aims, and then there's, the mani then there's the understanding of using the energy toward rightful aims, right, which in martial arts is kind of a, a grand subject, right? Taekwondo in itself is always in the use of self-preservation and self-defense. There are certain ethical lines to be drawn in order to utilize certain energy whatsoever. Okay. So, in this mention of uh, kind of this trope term of kundalini awakening, this, this kind of rebirth into a new dimension of consciousness, right? These are the sorts of words that we can throw out there to throw anybody of, uh, say, like a more practical mind right out the window, right? This powerful field of energy that is attained in oneself. Now, let's try to break this down in a way that seems more palpable, perhaps. If you step into a certain room and there are candles lit about and there are nice people and they're having candid conversation and there are objects throughout that room that are that are very comfortable, you know, these kind of big comforters and the colors are quite uh, warm and natural, that is a feeling that can be procured that is also within yourself and seemingly outside of yourself. There are certain things that you can do to achieve a state within yourself of a certain emotion, right? You climb a mountain, it was super arduous, there was so much physical labor that went into that, and so the arrival at the peak and the arrival at the height can be uh, like a runner's high at the very least, or even a transcendent experience of bliss that was earned by the effort of climbing that mountain. So this kundalini awakening per se, you know, this this involvement of oneself inside of oneself of this feeling of spiritual bliss um, is likened to that uh, to take the metaphor of the mountain as as a, as a way to equivocalize it in your mind um, this is also to say that there are energies out there within this philosophy that are uh, understood to be malevolent astral forces right there are many different ways that we can feel there are many different ways that these things can meet us there are many negative, very palpable negative energies that can 
take over our body. And just to put that, you know, how many times have you had horrible thoughts, right? In the late hours of the night as you are, you know, flailing in your bed sheets, sweating, whatever, right? Nightmares. These are thought of as malevolent astral forces, which, you know, has that spiritual wording to it. But we all understand what it means to be full of anxiety, dread, angst. You know, these are these are the ways that these things substantiate. And this is what these spiritual traditions are ultimately reacting to, just to kind of level the, the playing field here, so to speak. So how to seek and how to kind of um, design yourself, per se, to invite in this feeling of transcendence is this ultimate seeking and was, it is still believed and has been ultimately believed to achieve physical long, longevity and to achieve even physical immortality by um, cultivation of this energy, by uh, religious devotion to maintaining this energy as a sort of healing system of the body. And as it was in the shamanic, it was about inducing the, the patients per se, the one who needed to be healed, introducing an energy into them and hoping that they could run it themselves, that their body would accept it and that would send away the disease. <clears throat> so there's this whole, you know, untapped conversation on the nature of healing within this, which is why it's ultimately a religious and spiritual subject. As has been mentioned previously in the course, this was the most fundamental thing that sent humanity down the road of religiosity, which was how to heal how to understand the nature of illness, and how to understand the nature of death. Okay, so, <laughs> you cannot take on these higher aspirations without a lot of learning, right? And to, to fight with somebody, per se, who is mastered in Tai Chi, you'll notice the, the, um, the key difference is their own sure-footedness. Their sure-footedness would allow them to take on greater postures and greater moves of, of greater extremism, per se. And that is because they have earned the wisdom of that sure-footedness. And this is both physically and abstractly speaking a necessity for reaching higher states or reaching higher charges of vibration, per se. And so that's why it's understood as an ultimate aspiration um, and something that is dedicated to uh, in these traditions. So... To make the further point, you know, once more, this is a process that is understood on many different levels. You know, again, energy is not just one form, right? So there are many different ways to come to understand how it functions, in what ways it comes to be. And so fascinating for us to consider what we do with the energy in the modern Western understanding, per se. You know, it is just something that moves through wires and cords through the air, you know, and is captured and ultimately put to some purpose. It's a very fascinating thing to ruminate on. So now we want to mention prana, which is, of course, the Hindi uh, Sanskrit way of approaching the same subject and also has, you know, this high level of sophistication, generations upon generations upon generations of studying and fine-tuning the understanding of what this means, prana. And if we pop open the Upanishad, the, the prashna, then we'll see a quote. It says, All that exists in the three worlds rests in the control of prana. As a mother protects her child, O prana, protect us and give us splendor and wisdom. So the prana is thought to take on the forms in the body of five different things, which is the mind, the prana of the mind, the prana of the breath, which is the main prana, breath as the kind of fundamental of all prana, then there is the energy of speech, hearing, and sight. And it's an old uh, parable to that there was this kind of test where the body wanted to know what among it was the most important. So it decided to send out each of its faculties one at a time to see if any of them were greater than the rest. And so sight left, yet the person still functioned the 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 um although was blind could still function right the ears left and though although deaf the mind still functioned and then the mind left and although that left it still lived right this is the vegetative state but when prana begins to leave 
the body actually dies, and then this rapid reclamation of life, because that was the most essential, the base of all bases, which was the prana, the life energy itself, which can be mundanely thought of as the breath, and as we've seen, spiritos sanctos, the sacred breath, the holy, the holy ghost, the holy spirit, breath is always spirit, the most fundamental of all fundamental things. So losing this life force is losing the breath, right? As soon as you stop breathing, the consciousness does not stay long within the body or is immediately breathed out, right? To witness somebody dying, oftentimes the feeling is that when they give out that last breath, that something is has left. Not is gone, but has left. And this is what has been always understood as this vital energy or this life force or this prana or whatever name we wish to ascribe this this act of the parable of the body gives prana the supremacy of all of it all of it that goes on so there are these different words that come along here which i'm not going to get too bogged down in terminology i hope today but the prana shakti and the shit shakti and the energy and the consciousness so the distinction between the two right sheet is uh, or chit, which is I I know that could be a misunderstood means mind or consciousness. We're dealing with different languages here, right? So the shakti is the power of consciousness, and just shakti as this cosmological force, as it is um, uh, alongside Shiva or the creative force. So you have this concept of the two functioning. Uh, or spiritually functioning sorts of energy, right? Because para is like the para brahman. If you remember us talking about that, para means the unmanifested state, which is when Shiva and Shakti are together, the masculine and the feminine, when they are together, there is no ebb and flow. This is the unmanifested state or the field or the ether, the akasha, what have you. Human consciousness comes to be by a certain ebb and flow of or anything comes to be because of Shiva and Shakti, which are the up and the down, or the masculine and the feminine aspects of vibration. <laughs> Creative consciousness comes from this ebbing and flowing. This embodied soul, Jivatma, is this ebbing and flowing. The spark of the divine, the drop from the infinite ocean of the Brahman, is coming from the infinite ocean of the unmanifested, which is when the line is just a line, when it's not ebbing and flowing, which is the kind of totality of all potentiation which exists everywhere all the time. It's only when something uh, starts to do that up and down thing that it's separate or it separates itself from it, which brings us back into the whole talk of the serpent, the serpent as a form, right? This ebbing and flowing, this vibrational form is the serpent's body. It is serpentining. And if it's serpentining, then that means we're alive, right? everything functions or everything comes to be in a certain regard. That's, of course, just one way to understand the serpent allegory. Okay. Uh, so prana giving all manner of energy to all the, f the functions of our bodies and the functions outside of our bodies. One must learn to control this prana as it is understood in these different yogic traditions, right? To, to work with yoga or even to work with uh, transcendent yoga. What is this ultimate aspiration if not to work with what is present? To relieve um, blockages in your own body, to make sure it all flows correctly. And of course, to anybody who has practiced yoga, then you know that this working with this act physically affects your mind mentally, which is reciprocal, of course. So this also could be understood as primary energy, vita, vital force, or simply breath, depending on how we're choosing to use this terminology. And the science of this terminology is equally as vast. So depending on what level we're talking about will change how this conversation goes. So, of course, in the greatest of sense, all of the universe is manifested forms of prana, right? The fact that it is existing, whether it's like simply a rock, then the vibration is just very, very, um, well, is, would it be, for, for the uh, so physicists, wouldn't it be very fast and that's why you can't move your hand into it? Or is it that it's very slow? 
these things work on different modes of vibration, right? Which these different modes of vibration give different physical manifestation and characteristics to it. Like if something's very hot, then the vibration is moving very quickly, which gives it the feeling of temperature, high temperature. And of course, if it's moving quite slow, then it appears quite cold, in which case that is simply that it's always prana, it's always the manifestation of this vibration, which all makes it prana and observable to us and interactable with us. However, it's only just distinctions in how it is characterizing this use of the up and down and up and down of the vibration. Okay, so the serpent power, the inner energy, that which transforms consciousness or the development of awakened prana, right, is the kundalini shakti which again is putting the preface on the feminine form of this energy again just like what we saw with chi to 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 prioritize the yin as opposed to the yang or to prioritize the invitation of the unmanifested energy or of pure consciousness which transcends all of creation so to invite in <laughs> The unvibration, which is the unmanifested, which would be to reach the totality of all things, right? Because the cosmic ocean is everywhere and is all-knowing and gives potential to all things. So this ultimate aspiration of moksha or awakening is also to rejoin the cosmic ocean, which would be to cease vibration in, in, the, in the right kind of way. And that's one way to approach this subject. <laughs> so, of course, there are distinctions for different higher selves or different um, kind of uh, steps up Jacob's ladder that this seeking of the internal prana or cultivation of prana can reach. There is the energy of consciousness, the Vatma Shakti or Shitti Shakti, which is the higher self, the Purusha. Um, you know, whether we're seeking the unmanifested prana or we're seeking an invitation of a more cosmic prana, um, this is just to say, how can I emulate or make myself a proper receptor for the invitation of this type of vibe as a different way of talking about it? Uh, so again, let's make it more mundane. So you've been real, you've been real messed up lately, right? You've been real stressed. What can you do with any um, reasonability, physically, mentally, what you can, what, uh, take yourself out of your room, right? Uh, go for a workout, take yourself to the river, uh, read a book, you know, uh, some people take like a nice warm bath. What things can you do to invite in this feeling of bliss? And it's the same, it's the same sort of effort. It's the exact same kind of mundane way of what can I do or what can I practice or what can I continually practice in order to seek the invitation of a certain sort of feeling inside of myself? And of course, you know, uh, this, this will ultimately bleed into esotericism, which is the threefold shakti, which is the will, knowledge, and action, just to take the translated words, which manifests itself as a trisula, which is the, the trident as it was appropriated into Greek via Poseidon, which, of course, Poseidon is the sea. Mm -hmm. Some interesting things there. And, you know, Shiva uh, or Shakti has this, or both, has this, you know, three-pronged spear to point to this. So this omnipotence of prana is something that's not wasted upon the approach of, you know, Hinduism. The prana shakti, the cosmic shakti, which is the organic phenomena of the universe, as, um, as it can be witnessed throughout organisms outside of yourself and fuels the activity of thought. So you're talking about uh, very nuanced understandings of what energy constitutes thought, right? That thought is a sort of energy. What you think about is something that you're running, right? And that this also can be not, well, maybe controlled, but more swayed, right? Your moods, your moods, your energy, your moods 
dictate your thoughts, right? What thoughts come out of you come from the source that is the mood. And so what sort of vessel are you? Or more like what sort of things are you inviting in to ultimately substantiate your thought? And then, you know, there are other energy supplies. So say you've been thinking about something a lot, but there's a whole nother sort of energy that gives you the will to act act on it. Or there is the energy of knowing, right? That is a specific sort of energy that somebody puts off. You uh, talk to somebody about a subject and you, and you come to find through discernment that they seem to know all about it. And that's because you recognize that energy that they know. It's very dissolving, as you can see. I hope, I hope I've been, haven't been speaking <laughs> with too much uh, uh, confusion. Mm. So something, too, about this re-mentioning of the prana being what we breathe, right? Because that, that ties it to all manner of spiritual traditions as we've touched on. That seemingly is a continuous well of, of um, reinvigoration of our supply, it being the most primary of all things. And of course now, which this isn't the subject for the class, not this time, but there is the act of taking that well and then creating with it, and that is the word. Right? I am taking the well of this energy of which I'm always intaking, and I am um, I'm I'm crafting it into noises, into meaning that ultimately derives into power or derives into a swaying of external elements. And so that think of this as more of a foundational talk to that later talk, but you know, what sort of things that we can manifest through the manifestation or through the manipulation of this kind of well of continuous energy that we're taking in. And so what? We can seek things through, you know, egoism. We can seek to use this this source, this, this um, power that's used for good or bad toward seeking ego gratification or instant gratification or what, right? What do we wish to do with this? So as a, as a kind of another parable or as another kind of mythological tie to this, you have Hanuman, which is the monkey god, the son of the wind in this mythology. And ultimately Hanuman surrendered to the divine, right? So to not use it towards your own aims, but surrendered to the divine, and gained the ability to become as large or as small as he wished, and subsequently overcomes all the obstacles that could be faced in this life, uh, accomplishing miraculous feats by virtue of surrendering to the divine, which again is an act of yin. Not yang, not to use it, but it's an act of yin, subordination. Not necessarily mm, surrender is is a great word for it. So maybe in the act of trying to control these things ultimately leads to the defeat, which is the appropriate transcendence through surrendering. (laughs) Without this vital energy, the body is nothing, right? And which ultimately, as we peel it back in mythology, is a lump of clay that has been molded together and breathed into, right? Whether we're talking about the Christian tradition or whatever. So without this... Uh, breath of God, as it is in that tradition, there is no beingness, there is no consciousness, there is no activity, right? What is a body other than a body without breath, right? If there's nothing in there, the body is just gross material. And this has been the subject of fascination for humans uh, in memorial, into the ancient past, into prehistory, which is a wellspring for what becomes this spirituality, What is the thing that substantiates the beingness of living? What is the thing that substantiates consciousness? How are we doing this? (laughs) How are we moving about? How do we have characters? How do we have personas? How do we have this ingeniousness about us, if not through something other than gross materialism of itself? And so bioelectricity is another kind of conduit, (laughs) pun intended, that we can take to further discuss this conversation this complex, seemingly subnuclear quantum, whatever, process that is this um, substantiation of our beingness uh, to see consciousness somewhere in the mind as a physical 
place by, you know, which is the pursuit of recent scientists, right? Trying to find that one organ or trying to find that one nodule in the mind that substantiates consciousness. And it can't be found because it would be to say that within these traditions, it is something about this bioelectricity, which is a moving thing. It's not in one place. It is the process, the summative process of a function, or perhaps it's somewhere within the function of those processes, somewhere within the quantum states, right? I, I, I'm not going to seek to aim to answer that. <laughs> But the energy is the thing that acts, thinks, knows, feels, and wills. All these things are a product of energy. They're different types of energy, but they're all a product of the same energy, vibration. Ooh. <laughs> so there is the thing that fuels the thought, which is known as prana shakti, fueling thought, which is that specific thinking energy. And then there is the shit shakti, which is the energy of consciousness as they are two distinct forms, distinct in the most, you know, in the way that energies can be most distinct. So it's just to say, I want to bring these subjects up for one giving out these words for further conversation and for further investigation, but also to give this strong nuance as to how this has been so sophisticated within Hindu mythology and within just the, the culture of Hindu in, 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 in India. Gosh, I'm, I'm yammering now. It's also to say that prana is the thing that forms the different uh, aspects of our own anatomy. The, the different open ends of our beingness, you know, our, our nostrils, our ears, our eyes, our mouth are all kind of things that were carved out through a necessity of prana. And again, prana isn't just the voice, right? It's also the senses. And so in order for these things to function most astutely or to be able to function, to take in these different types of energy via sight, via audio, via smell, then it had to form these sorts of openings. So prana is thought to create the different aspects of the anatomy as it extends into conversations of the nadis, which are N-A-D-I-S, which are innumerable in the body and thought of as these little energic points that are teased at by acupuncture or are utilized as pressure points by, say, the military, but all facilitate good or bad health feeling congested, feeling weak, feeling healthy, all these things as they are understood in these various nadis, which are, in principle, the main ones are 14, but then, of course, there are the, the main energy points, which are the chakras, which is, you know, a whole other discussion of itself, which all these chakras are the homes for different sorts of energies that can be cultivated in the body via sexual energy, via transcendent energy, via earthly energy, concrete energy. All these things as they are distinguished in different points of the body, as they are invited into the body, as they are cultivated within the body, right? If one thing is more blocked and another is more open, yada, 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 yada. Ooh. But of course, the ultimate aspiration, nod, as it is the uh, root of the verb nadi, means motion or flow or vibration. So the ultimate aspiration is to let it all flow and let it all go and to not have these blockages on every single letter, let level of your subtle circuitry, <laughs> every single annal of your physical presence to not be blocked and to be opened up in all of these forms. And all of these invisible dimensions of your beingness and in your existence, it is accommodant to the flow of this energy, whatever energy it takes form of. And so to not rule over your thoughts and to not rule over it, but to allow yourself to become something that is ruled by it. Prana as it governs the intake of sensory impressions, samana as it governs your mental digestion and circulation, apana, which it is the uh, elimination of toxicity in the body in all of its various forms, manifesting itself into toxic thoughts. However, it is rooted in negative emotion, mood, ambient spirit vibration and the udana which is the opposite which is the positive mental energy enthusiasm motivation vigor 
And so you can see how every person, if you look at any person, they are a cocktail of these different kind of emotion, emotional idiosyncrasies, right? Everybody brings about that with them a certain level of, you know, deflatedness or a certain level of enthusiasm with certain subjects or a certain level of, you know, uppity energy or very docile energy. And all of these things are the different cocktail of what that individual not ha like has cultivated or what cho they choose to accept or what that specific vessel um, satellites itself for. It becomes receptive of because all sorts of energy are out and possible at all times in all directions everywhere. But they are a curation, uh, a very distinct curation of these energies as they breathe it in and out on the daily. So... <clears throat> What is this talk of immortality, right? What is this talk of of being able to seek something greater? You know, like, uh, is this something that is observable or is this allegory? I don't stand to say, but it is to say that in the discussion of that aspiration, there is the word soma. And the soma, as it is understood and as it's been mentioned in the course before, is ultimately by Western scholars been thought to be understood as a drink of which facilitates um, transcendent plant medicine-like experiences. However, there is an argument to say that the reign of the nectar of the Sahasrara is the kundalini energy as it is drink drank inside the body allegorically, not physically. So the idea of the soma or achieving the nectar of the crescent moon is this ultimate aspiration of what is said as immortality, but it's also more like hinting at what um, I was talking about before with the kundalini and chi. It is to say to reach that place of ultimate flow is to drink the soma, and that's yet another interpretation. But of course, this concept has its own ways that it divulges outwards. This is definitely a comparative religious subject this, this idea of kundalini, the snake, and the ultimate kind of realization goes out to the birth of Christ, goes out to China, goes out to the Persians in different ways, goes out to the Greeks, goes out to the Romans, I mean onward and onward, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, some sort of emblem that hints this ancient knowing of kundalini that very likely predates uh, human civilization and all manner of record that we have to substantiate human civilization. This has to be something that goes as far back as we could ever hope to say. This is also something that in certain ways we could even, with more haphazardness, trace to Native American traditions, most notably the Hopi, and you know, is littered all throughout mystical terminology, occultism, and esotericism. And this is also to hint at the fact that it's been present for thousands upon thousands of years. You know, Neolithic evidence of this correlation between the sun and the serpent or the disc and the serpent or the egg and the serpent. You know, uh, how far back can we take this specific investigation of the serpent being a exact allegory for the Kundalini or for, you know, the, the very subject of sacred spiritual energy? <laughs> so this is a much more of a divulgence as it as it is much greater than the conversation of alchemy, right? Because alchemy, alchemy would ultimately work with things and would ultimately have its beginning, in quotes, with uh, Hermes Trismegistus or Thoth, uh, the Thrice Greats in the Egyptian mythology. But this is to say that this is something that can be traced back into, you know, back when it was stones, right? The Neolithic age at the very least. So let's, instead of working with this more technical, let's, let's see how this might have taken shape in other ways across the world, which I want to start with the Wakan of the Lakota, Wakan Tonka, which I always, as, as I had been privy to, to circles and to sweat lodges, I always heard Wanka Tonka, which I think could be its own kind of, I'm, I'm not going to make guesses on that. There are certain ways to try to translate Wakan, which is... Uh, of course, tricky because you're not only dealing with translation, but you're also dealing with culture. And you're also talking about that this is a very nuanced thing that is brought to a kind of more subtle understanding as opposed to a more overt understanding. 
And what I mean by that is we often want the, the definition given hard and fast and straight so that we can immediately contextualize all that goes into it. But what if we're missing the context of which this kind of definition could be contextualized with? We, we're running into the same issue with talking about the dream time with the aboriginals and any time you're hoping to understand what the Tao is. So the certain translation for Wakan or Wakantanka is the great mystery, the great mystery. And But at the same time, this, this great mystery is the progenitor of all the things that have ever come into being. So this is where it gives us a very curious twist on all creation stories. If we think of this primordial energy, right? This grand potentiation before vibration was ever even conceived of. This is the Wakantankan or the allegory as it was in Hinduism, the great ocean of which we all are a drop of. Okay, so in the great emptiness, which is called Han, which is darkness, or the Guna Gap, or Nun, or the waters at the beginning, right? In, in this tradition, with the Lakota, Han, darkness, and him, feeling lonely, Wakantankan, feeling lonely, decided to create companions, great spirit, focused energy, creating the rock, the first god, rock, creating earth, Maka, creating sky, we, which is the sun, which became the sun, or made the sun, Il, Inya, and Maka, and himself, four gods, creating further gods, creating moon, wind, falling star, thunderbird, creating the uh, further aspirations as the kind of, um, the hierarchy further and further descends, as it always does in creation stories, you know, uh, the whirlwind, the buffalo, the four winds, the two-legged creatures, which is us, creating the spirit of death, the breath of life, Nia, uh, and the shadow, uh, Sikon, thought, creating all manner of everything that's ever come to be as it delineates all from the great spirit, the Wakan, or the Wakatankan. So the word Wakan is also used a great deal in um, observation of specific things. So, you know, usually we wouldn't say, you know, <laughs> as you're looking around in your environment, and you're saying that's God, that's God, right? So this is a very different approach, right? It's to say that Wakan is the mystery and is something great and is frequently observable in things. When things are sacred, they have the Wakan, but many things have Wakan, um, which soon we'll be going over. Uh, other names. So obviously, Great Spirit grandfather. Um, these, these are the ones that are used more ubiquitously in, in the translation as it comes across, especially Great Spirit, which <clears throat> are these the names for many things or are these the names of the one being? And the answer is yes, <laughs> that it is all those things because it is in latent in all things. So how can you distinguish the different forms that ultimately are it? if you understand, right? Same would be the conversation with the aforementioned prana and chi. You know, how could you say that this thing is, is it the one thing or is it all things? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And so, you know, to work with this is the work of a shaman. Technically, we all work with it, but to be very acquainted with it is the work of a shaman, which again, tie that over to India and who's the one that works with the prana? Well, that would be the, the uh, you know, the yogis, uh, the, the bodhisattvas, right? And so in the same way, it's the shaman. The shaman is the one that works with the wakan to use it in a specific way, right? And the specific way to use it oftentimes lends itself to music because music is a vehicle for prayer or to use drums, rattles, to use the voice and to open yourself up in that sort of way is a communication with energy. It is an invitation of energy, right? If you're feeling down, try to sing a song and see what happens to you, right? To invoke yourself with this mood or to invoke the universe to manifest something peculiar is to sing, is to create music. Music is something we depend on if, and, it's, and, and most certainly if we involve ourselves with it that can provide transcendent experiences. And this is why drums 
ceremonial chanting, dancing, all these things have always been a part fundamentally of the religious experience because it is how we interact with or invite into ourselves the energy of that which is all around us at all times. <laughs> how to procure it in the way that we want to procure it in a way that is altruistic or in a way that invites optimism or hope. Um, how can we ascertain these things if we don't engage with it, which this is a way that we engage with it. There, are, of course, are things that are not good energies, which have this kind of evil wakan, which is things that fear the, 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 the sage. They fear the smoke of the sage. The good spirits love the energy of the sage, and the bad don't. They, they reject it. Um, and that's a kind of like tool to, to, to utilize, right? What things are ultimately always going to invite good moods towards me is a certain sort of question. The sweet grass has also been a fundamental tool, which has its own spirit and energy, but it attracts its likeness, right? Which if it is great, things attract its likeness. And if it's not like it, then it repels it. Thus, it's a tool against those things. Oh... Okay, I need to calm down a little bit. Okay. So in this way, these plants are wakan, which means they have energy, which are beneficial towards specific purposes. Wakan as it is power or as it is effectualness in this world. The plants that help are wakan, but also the plants that don't are wakan, right? If it's poisonous, that's wakan. So whatever has this sense of agency is wakan. And so, you know, what would be poison to one is a poignancy of energy which would be poisonous to one but would be medicine to another in small attributes, right? So to call things good and bad is a very tricky uh, notion of this, right? It's just to say that it has power, it has agency, it has a trick, right? It has teeth in this world, right? It has something that it can do. So, of course, like animals, all manner of animals have wakan. Alcohol has wakan. It makes people crazy. So it's it's it has agency in this world. Um, food, all manner of food, all manner of ingestion, all manner of it, of it supplying you is wakan, right? Um, babies, babies are wakan, and they're wakan in their own very distinct way. Um, there's there's uh, also all manner of very old things are quite imbibed with wakan, which is also a, a different way to translate this per se, or I, I should say approach it, is something with meaning, right? If it has significance in some form, if we approach it in an air of significance, then we imbibe it with wakan, or we imbibe it with energy, and it holds that. Since everything is energy, it can take it, right? It's a vessel for it in some form. So people talk about rocks, right? <laughs> rocks, as this is like this, like, uh, you know, people making fun of them for thinking that they have these metaphysical attributes. It ultimately derives back into this animism or into this sacred energy or spiritual energy that is inlaid in all things, which is to say that anything can be a vessel for anything. Anything can be significant, right? Anything can have meaning. Anything is capable of allegory, right? The mountain, if we have a story, if we have uh, a significance that many people have given to that mountain, that mountain is not just a mountain. That mountain becomes a vessel for all the meaning that has been poured into it. All things are capable of withholding such energy or capable of becoming wakan. Oh, God. So every object of everything that is perceivable is capable of this and is also in itself already has inlaid in spirit. Now, if we take this over to the Iroquois, then there's the Orenda, which I don't know if I'm saying that correct. It's O-R-E-N-D-A. And this is a very similar concept with a different word, a transmissible spiritual energy in capable of whatever capable of exceeding or enacting somebody's will that is in latent in all things. Again, so every animal has its own agency, thus it has renda. And, you know, as it, as it translates out to plants. 
storms are said to have tremendous arenda, which again, we could say positive or negative. But again, if we think of the storm as purely negative, it is, uh, it is going to be so. However, a destructive force can be a source of renewal for the land. It can be a creative force, right? You have to clear off the whiteboard to be able to write something new on it. So the destructive force, right? It's a force. It's an energy that is present in it, right? It carries it for whatever way that you wish to um, contextualize that, right? I mean, I've said it before in the course, but there's that quote, devils are angels in disguise, right? Um, opportunities towards wisdom. So, you know, this is this, this bringing up of the Iroquois and, and even like uh, this juxtaposition between that and Wakan with the, with the Sioux or with the Lakota or to take other terms for the Algonquins or take, it, take other terms from the Mohawk or from the Shoshone. This is to say that this concept is universal in some form, but focusing on the, uh, on the orenda to say the root word ren is the power of song. What is song if not vibration, ambience carried by the medium of air or by the medium of spirit? So in the very kernel center of the word that is the universal things across all things, it is song, which is beautiful, that everything's a song. And I've used the example before, but with J.R. Tolkien's creation story for the Lord of the Rings via the Samarillion, everything ultimately was the song, the singing of Iluvatar in the Ainu. It's to say that in the comparative religious subject and study of J.R. Tolkien, he obviously came to this fundamental, which we can see is hidden within many mythologies and creation stories across the world, as this subject is. So it is to say that every species and everything has its own specific way of cultivating the song in what song they're singing. And as a caveat to this, I want to bring up two more brief subjects. There is, of course, the mana, which was previously discussed when we were discussing the Polynesians, but we also see in some forms with the Melanesians, which the distinction here is that it can be either good or bad, but it is agency, and it is in latent in all manner of things, inanimate objects, persons, and spirits. <clears throat> And so what's that? Spirits, as they are active in this world and have some measure of agency on how things are affected. Impersonal, amoral, supernatural force, as it's been defined by Westerners. Amoral in the sense that it is force. It is a tool. It is something that can be utilized. Um, it's something that can be grown in a person. How much power do you have over your life? How much power do you have over people? And when I say power, don't think of it in the capitalistic sense. Think about agency. How much sway? How much do you invite that in on yourself, right? And of course, then uh, with, with the Polynesians and the Melanesians, they would say that their leaders had great mana because the leaders would have great sway on what would and wouldn't happen. <laughs> And then, you know, look over to the Finnish and to the Baltics. You have Veiki, V-A-K-I. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. That's the whole subject. I'm a reader, not a speaker. I, don't, I haven't been all these places. But it is to say that yet again in this tradition across the world, now with the Finnish, we see that there are uh, concepts, a concept for em a strong emotional presence to the inlatent universe, a strong... Uh, ability to imbibe objects, places, things, people with Veiki, which is energy, which sounds very similar to Reiki, strangely enough. Ki, Ki, Chi. Hmm, maybe it's coming through Siberia. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, we might have to look into that. It could be through the Samoyedic people. I wouldn't be surprised to see that the Siberian tribes have a different words for this if it's not just simply translations of the word spirit in different animistic traditions. 
But with the finish and the and the and the Baltics in this instance, people with special gifts, seers, are the most capable of tracing or observing the individual spiritual entities as they weave in and out of all things, right? So the shaman, in the same respect, is the seer that can recognize something that has been affecting you that needs to be dealt with, released, or transmuted. And this is to say that even if we don't believe like in immortality per se, if we don't want to take that huge leap into the spiritual energy field, <laughs> then it is to say that our approach to life and what moods we take into our, ourselves ultimately result in physical ailments of which are only treated by changing that mood. Anxiety, chronic anxiety as it leads to inflammation, as it leads to, ah, uh, man, all manner of, of heart issues, high blood pressure, which results in what? I mean, give a cavalcade of different things that that can result in. But to get back on point, religious places and settings, such as ceremonies, you know, as they are held in cemeteries, this act imbibes the veiki with into these places, right? So answering a question of why is this place sacred and another isn't? And that's because people, people have imbibed it with a sort of energy that makes it independently significant. But this veiki, not just only as it applies to specific places as it's inladen with people's significant, but it, significance, but it might also have an innate presence of which inspired them to um, ascribe further significance via their own energy to its energy. <laughs> there are many different types of veiki as it comes to this specific tradition. There is the energy of death. <clears throat> You know, and this facilitates certain burials, and this is why ancient people uh, did everything that they could to perform rituals for the dead in order to transmute that energy. They couldn't have that around. And that's why it was so important for funerals to be taken place, is to transmute that. There's the energy of the sauna, as it is, right, idiosyncratically, culturally significant to the Finnish. <clears throat> And I would argue beyond and should be significant to all of us, right? With the natives, you have the sweat lodges. There's the energy of fire, right? The, the potential to heal through fire. That's why we get fevers to burn and to take impurities out of us. But also it's the inflammation, the yang, that is also a detriment to us. There's the specific veiki energy of the forests in latent within them. There's the specific energy of cliffs, mountains, of which is only viewed as like the ma most masterful to work with that energy. And then lastly, and this is an exhaustive list, but I think a good place to cap this, the energy inlaid into the Veiki, inlaid into in bodies of water, in lakes, and wells. So all of these things that I've listed have a certain ambience about them, right? There's the way that you feel at the cusp of the ocean. There's the way you feel at a lake. These things are only possible by their very beingness. There's the way you feel when you're in the forest. There's the way you feel with that tree. These are things that are only possible in that forest. These moods, as they are only found in latent in those things. The energy of a city, the energy of a cemetery, all these things are not good or bad. It just depends on approach and it depends on what energy you carry. <laughs> so... Let's do some summative notes. Now, this is to say that this concept is older than old. This is to say that I, I can't, I will not stand to say that this subject has come up independently and spontaneously across the world because I do, and that's very possible, but I do believe that this is something that has been known from time immemorial and has taken all manner of different forms through different languages and different words, but still they all resemble each other in different ways. They all have certain fundamental truths about them in different ways. And there's been a great forgetfulness of this kind of truth, a great ignorance of this kind of truth. And it, it's not, 
it's not to say, right, like it's not, not to convert everybody to be spiritual, but it is to say that everything is energy, <laughs> which is, you know, the the growing, ever growing um thesis of scientific investigation into quantum physics and such. I mean, it's an inevitability that it's going to have to be a reoccurrent conversation in that pursuit. You know, we have panpsychism, we have the concept of the prima materia, you know, in seeking what things were like at the initial Big Bang, right? Perhaps it was very placid, perhaps that was the point before vibration manifested, perhaps that was the point before yin and yang came to be, right? And in all these creation stories, you have the creator that is placid in some form and then decides to shake things up or is lonely or whatever, right? Whatever reason comes to it, the shaking things up usually creates a male and a female, a god and a goddess of some sort. And that is the masculine, the sacred masculine, the sacred feminine, as they are both necessitated in the nature of vibration. <laughs> Yin, yang, up, down, up, down. And everything that substantiates all the things that are born come from that delineation, come from that vibration. <sighs> so I don't have like, this isn't a part where I get to preaching, but I want to say that, you know, in this, in this mention of alchemy in the previous sessions of the course, this is something that ultimately kept scratching away at the subject that I felt like I couldn't divulge into because obviously it leads to me talking endlessly like this. So, you know, in, in whatever conversation, in approach to different religious conversations, in approach to different, like, even plant medicines and experiences one has had in plant medicines, a lot can be explained by retaking this approach, by, re, or by, by respecting this approach, and by understanding how foundational it is to all religious and spiritual mythologies, scriptures, onward and onward to conjure, to, to create incantation, to do magic, to do witchcraft, is to do the same thing as, you know, taking a bath <laughs> for the procured usage of a particular vibe that you wish to invite into yourself. Um, it's all utilizing the field that is ever-present all around us. It's all taking from the potentiation. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to stop. <laughs>